um, and, and good follow up um, on the videos on our YouTube channel afterwards. And I think, yeah. you know, most breweries, if they, they can't make it, they'll go to our YouTube channel and watch this. I'm uh, going to go ahead and let people in. Yeah, go ahead. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. I'll give just a couple more seconds. Welcome, welcome. Okay. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Myers, and welcome to the fifth day of the New York State Craft Brewers Conference presented by DWS. I will be the moderator for the session. You are you are joining Understanding Sensory Experience of Beer with AI. Very excited topic. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of things. I want to thank our Friday presenting sponsor, Yakima Chief Hops, and also our Friday session sponsors. Uh, <clears throat> Surpass Chemical Company, Deschutes Beverage Technologies, and Frauhofer Designs. Thank you guys so much for the support. We really appreciate it. I will be posting stuff in chat. Uh, if you have any questions or about the links or you think you might have missed anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. If you have a question, please feel free to put your question in chat throughout this session or use the raise your hand function and we'll be happy to call on you when appropriate. Now without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce the presenters. First, we have Jean Van Dama from Esther and Kevin Van Stapen from the University of Leuven. Thank you guys so much. We're excited to have you. I'm uh, going to go ahead, Kevin, and, and hand it over to you so you can go ahead and start your presentation. All right. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, and let me start my screen here. It's always uh, it's great to be here, uh, first of all, and, and welcome to the session that we're um, um, going to talk about today. And I think we're, we're pretty honored to be among um, some incredible, in, incredibly interesting speakers. And I, I followed a few sessions this week and it's been, it's been really tremendous and interesting. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, so as Jen mentioned, my name is Jean Van Dem. Um, and, and today I'm joined by uh, Professor Kevin Vistepa uh, at the University of Leuven. And I'll, I'll give Kevin a chance to introduce himself in a, in a second. But first, I just wanted to give a brief overview of what we're going to talk about and, and what you can expect in the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, and if my slides want to go on here, yeah, that's great. So first of all, as I said, we're going to do a quick intro. Um, then I will talk really briefly about some of the challenges that we see for brewers and consumers that basically inspired us to uh, to start this project and to start Esther as a company. Um, then I'll let Kevin dive a little bit deeper in, in the connection between sensory science and artificial intelligence. Um, and then I will take back the floor and, um, and talk about how we are bringing that to the market. Um, the, the technology and bringing that to the market is really important. And, and then we want to end by uh, also showing or talking a little bit about what the value of our data and our insights uh, can be for brewers. And we want to make sure uh, that there is enough time for Q&A. Uh, we know that through Zoom, it's not always easy to get that kind of questions, but we really enjoy having a conversation here. So if you have a question that pops up, please uh, share it in the chat and um, we can tackle it at the end of the session or if it's a very pressing question, um, I'm sure Jen will interrupt us and, and let us answer it in the middle of the session as well, okay? Um, and then let's start immediately. And so as a quick intro, <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Kevin and I'll give the floor to Kevin for uh, a few minutes to, to you know, introduce who you are, Kevin, and uh, talk a little bit about your research. Thanks, John. Hey, everyone. Good morning for you. Good afternoon for me. It's almost beer o'clock here in Belgium. Um, so I'm Kevin Restrepin. I'm a uh, professor in, in genetics at the University of, of Leuven. But, you know, before you tune off, um, yes, I'm doing genetics research, but everything is about yeast in my lab. Um, since we have some time, maybe maybe it's fun to quickly tell you uh, what happened. I, I, when I was studying, I was supposed to be a, a cancer researcher, but then I got 
sidetracked and for my master thesis I, I ended up in South Africa at the University of Stellenbosch um, in the lab for wine biotechnology and it's the first time I started working on yeast and on <laughs> alcoholic beverages uh, and I kind of like the combination of the two um, so doing research into yeast flocculation there uh, which is important also for sparkling wines as you guys know then I went back to Belgium for a PhD studying uh, the genetics underlying, sorry about that, the genetics underlying um, yeast flavor formation in beer. Um, so really discovering the genes that are important for especially the fruity esters that beer yeast make. And then I actually came to the US and that's maybe why I'm, why I'm saying is I lived in Boston for six years. Uh, first a postdoc at MIT, really using yeast as a model for genetics. So there was no alcohol in my, in my postdoc. Um, but then when I started my own lab uh, over at Harvard uh, as, a, as a junior um, group leader there, uh, we started doing a bit more applied research there. And I became an avid fan of the, the US uh, craft beers, which were really up and rising at that time. Um, 2000s, early 2000s, um, and I was there for six years. And actually, since then, I moved the lab back to Belgium at the end of, uh, of that period. Um, I've been advocating uh, US craft beers here quite a bit. And I can tell you in the beginning, Belgian brewers were maybe not so enthused about some of the crazy IPAs <laughs> that were then going around <laughs> the US. Um, but in the meantime, they've definitely caught up. So, so you guys can definitely credit yourselves for introducing beer styles in Belgium. Um, anyway, that aside, my uh, next slide maybe, Jean. My lab in the meantime has grown quite considerably. We're about 35 people, 40 people now, um, mostly PhD students and postdocs. Um, and half of them do basic research where we uh, use yeast as a model for genetics and genomics. Uh, and the, the more fun half of the lab um, really is involved in very applied research. Uh, much of that in collaboration with various breweries. You see some of them on this slide, not all of them. And yes, there's some of the very big ones on there, uh, just as well as, as some uh, really small craft brewers, mostly here in Belgium, a few US ones as well. Um, and this name of Esther you see there, uh, you know, uh, in, in larger font size is just that as this talk is mostly going to be about. Um, we started doing some work on aroma and then found, or Jean found, found us, and uh, we started collaborating a bit around this idea of uh, really applying our research towards uh, consumers and brewers. Next slide, please. So like I already said, um, one half of the lab really does genetics research. And then for the applied research, what we mostly do is try to create superior beer yeast or industrial yeast, not just beer. We also have yeast that produces um, uh, pharmaceuticals. So in, in that sense, I fly a long way around uh, the block. I ended up doing what I was supposed to do, <laughs> working a little bit on medical research, but also bioplastics, but again, most of uh, the industrial work we do is uh, in collaboration with breweries trying to make better beer yeast that can ferment better, uh, quicker, produce different new funky aromas or better aromas. Um, so that's really the core of our business. But then as we were doing this, um, measuring aroma compounds in beer produced by yeast at first, but then largely so it expanded to just beer aromas in general. Um, we also got more and more intrigued in understanding um, beer aroma. And, and that is what most of this talk is going to be about. So it's, it's a bit weird for me to not talk about yeast that much. It's one of the few talks I, I give that, is, that doesn't really involve much yeast. Next slide. Yeah, awesome. Um, sorry, if you want to go on, uh, Kevin, no. or do you mind if I switch really quickly to? to it's perfect. Uh, maybe then... maybe I conclude by I can conclude by saying that uh, yes, Jean will now introduce a little bit what we're doing, and then I'll get back into the science of exactly what we've been doing. Exactly. Thank you. So yeah, first as a as a quick introduction from me. So my my name is Jean. As I said, uh, I'm. Uh, 
I'm from Belgium. I uh, was born and raised in Leuven, uh, where the university is uh, that, that Kevin is also linked to, um, and is also the origin city of uh, Stella Artois. Um, so I obviously grew up a little bit with the, the fumes of the brewery in, in my nose, um, and then decided to go study bioengineering and food technology uh, at the university. Um, after that, I ended up working in grocery retail. So I worked for the largest grocery chain in Belgium um, for several years. Um, but then after, after that, decided to move to New York uh, because my, <laughs> my uh, wife is American and she told me you have to move here. Um, and so that's for me the, the moment that I decided to start Esther. Um, and, and for us, the, or for me, the basic observation that drove me to start the company uh, was that decision making <clears throat> in the food industry is more often than not driven by data that is not so great, right? And, and even though we spend a lot of time and a lot of resources um, in gathering data through focus groups, tastings, we gather or pay for market data, et cetera, um, the, the, the right data or the, the data that you actually need to make good decisions is, uh, is quite often lacking. And even if it's there um, today, it's mostly available to very large companies. And so I really wanted to change that um, and make this better data and, and the flavor data specifically uh, available to more people in the industry. Uh, not with the goal of you know, driving you all to make the same product, but with the goal of driving innovation and experimentation. And so it's at that point that I, uh, that I started to talk to Kevin and, um, and saw the idea and, and Nikki Udovan as a, as a perfect partner for this, for this journey. Um, and so before we dive into the science, indeed, I just want to tell, talk a little bit about uh, what the challenges for brewers and consumers are today. And to kick that off, I just want to tell you a, a story that I was told um, by a Belgian brewer a uh, mid-sized brewer uh, in, in the market now um, that has a couple of beers that are pretty popular. And um, we were talking about new product developments. And so he told me that almost every month his brewing team and his technical team came up with a new beer uh, that they tried to make, that they, you know, that they, that they made in a small batch and that everybody agreed on was a good beer, something that was kind of, you know, worthy of the market. Um, and then I asked him, how many do you launch in the market? And he told me, well, on average, I think we launch one beer uh, every five years. Uh, and so that to me was very telling that I asked him why that was. And he told me for a growing brewery like his, it's too risky. It's too much of an investment to, to launch new beers every month. Um, and so before they make that decision, they do a lot of research and they test a lot uh, before it actually hits the market. Now, I know that in the US and, and for a lot of American and, and smaller breweries, that's, you know, they're a, a, a lot more bold in uh, that decision and they launch beers at a much higher pace. Uh, but then a second challenge comes up, which is how do you get your beer in front of the consumer, right? And, and definitely in the past year or 18 months, and um, I think on Monday in the trends talk, uh, we talked about that, like when on-premise is, is being hit this hard by the pandemic, everybody is kind of shifting towards off-premise sales. Um, but the, the spots there are really, really expensive, right? And, and it's really hard to get your beer in front of as many consumers as possible. Um, and so you're, you're basically up for uh, a negotiation with a, with a retailer uh, where you have to show the retailer like, look, this beer is going to sell because it's a beer that aligns with consumer preferences, which is not easy to do. Even on top of that, we see that e-commerce is, is really transforming. Eh? We, we, I think you all saw what happened with Drizzly and, and how they saw tremendous growth, not only in sales, but also in the number of retailers on their platform. And they predict that 20% of the, of the alcoholic, alcoholic category is going to be and stay online uh, moving forward. And so that kind of number, um, that kind of tells us that e-commerce is something to take seriously. And I think the Craft Brewers Association, the National Association, um, published a, a report saying that brewers are, are typically finding their way to e-commerce or at least exploring that. 
Um, and, and so that e-commerce is for beer is going to be something that we are going to see in the market. But that's not easy either, because the, the biggest problem with e-commerce is that there's so much choice and, and it's really hard to find your way in that. And so what we said was like, well, if you start seeing those movements or those, those um, evolutions in the market, um, you really need to find solutions to get the right product in front of the right consumer. And we see personalization as one of the biggest areas for opportunity where it adds convenience and it basically helps a consumer to not have too much choice anxiety. So basically what we, what we see as the biggest challenge for a producer in, in the new situation that we're in or in this situation that we're in currently is not only how do you develop uh, new products and, and how do you kind of know in advance as much as possible that a product is going to work, but also how do you get it to that consumer? How do you get it in front of the consumer that will really enjoy it? Um, and that's what Esther in the end is, is all about. Um, and so what I'd like to do is first let Kevin uh, jump into the science and then I will talk a little bit more about how we bring that to the market. So Kevin, back to you. Right, thanks, Jean. So the way we've rolled into this particular research is a little bit different than Jean's in the sense that um, we're not a commercial lab or, or uh, an enterprise in any way. We're a research lab at the university. Like I said, we uh, are doing a lot of yeast research, also including uh, aroma. But obviously, <laughs> it doesn't come as a surprise that most of the people in my lab are, are avid beer lovers. We, we also have a pilot brewery in the lab. Um, and you know, on occasion, we, we drink beers and discuss beers. We have a tasting panel as well. And one of the things that frustrated us is that it's very difficult to describe a beer in a scientific manner, right? Uh, if you open up any beer guide, you will find very poetic uh, descriptions of a particular beer. It's malty, it's hoppy, floral, uh, great mouthfeel um, but then you see a next beer <laughs> it, it pretty much has the same words and um, the only thing you can really do to appreciate them is taste them and even if you taste them um, on different days it will be extremely difficult to compare and to exactly know how they differ and, and where to place them and since we're nerdy engineers mostly <laughs> we we want hardcore data we want to see a map exactly you know how does this beer relate to the other and how can we describe it in a very quantitative scientific way and since we had all this equipment to measure yeast aromas and more generally beer aromas we figured hey in a way we have everything uh, in our hands because we literally have a battery of machines that that will determine hundreds of chemicals in beer that together make up the aroma. Um, can we use machine learning, artificial intelligence to try and finally link the chemistry to taste and also appreciation of these beers? And can, can we use this, this hardcore scientific quantitative data to then describe the beers in, in a more uh, quantitative um, and, and comparative way. So that, that was really the general idea way before we, we met Sean and we set out to, to try and do this. Next slide, please. But it's not an easy task. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, beer is a complex product uh, with, with hundreds of aroma compounds. I, I, at this mixed conference where I say that, that wine is more expensive, but beer is more complex and that that is not fair. Um, but it's true. I mean, wine is a very complex product as well, uh, but arguably in terms of aroma compounds, beer is even more diverse because we just have more different ingredients, right? So we have uh, hundreds of, of chemicals that all contribute to some extent to the aroma. Uh, and uh, they come from different sources, yeast, the spices, uh, the malt, and of course the whole brewing process itself. Um, and also chemically, they belong to very different classes of uh, chemical compounds. Next slide, please. 
to make matters worse, um, you cannot study them one by one. I mean, you can, but it doesn't solve the whole puzzle. So yes, you can take each of these compounds once you know they're in beer and smell them and say, oh, isoamyl acetate smells like banana. And I bet if I have that in my beer, my beer will have a banana flavor, which is to some extent true. However, by mixing all these things together, um, everything becomes a bit more complex because you have interactions between these compounds, right? You have uh, two bananas yield, five bananas. Uh, you can have 4-VG masking the phenylethyl acetate that gives you the, 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 the rosy, flowery aroma, um, or actually the other way around. Um, and yeah, you have compounds that actually completely block each other almost. And, and all these, these different interactions are extremely difficult to study. We, we know a few of them, um, but even, even so, when you start mixing 100 compounds, the, the matrix becomes really complex. Um, plus, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? Um, it can be subtle masking, it can be subtle synergism, subtle, subtle antagonism. So it's, it's, it's a whole gray zone in between. So to us, that really screamed um, artificial intelligence. We just need a huge data set. Uh, we need to know for many beers exactly what's in there. And then we need to taste these beers in a, in a very descriptive scientific way, and then let machine learning figure out the rest and see if we can, if we can uh, develop models that really connect the dots really. Um, next slide. So that's exactly what's in, in this slide. And we wanted to do this not only for specific uh, aromas that you can, uh, you can pull out, but we figured it would also be interesting and fun to, to also do it to try and predict overall appreciation from the chemical compounds. So that might seem like, like a silly <laughs> thing to do. Um, I mean, the best way to, to know if you like a beer is to, <laughs> is to drink it. Um, but then as scientists, it's, it's, a, it's a nice challenge to say, hey, can we just take a beer, measure the chemistry of it, and then predict how well the average consumer will like it or specific consumers will like it. Um, and we've done this with our own tasting panel. So we have a highly trained tasting panel uh, in the lab of around 20 people. But then we also pulled um, data from beer rating websites. Uh, we have some computer nerds in the lab that are very good at data scraping, which is uh, legal for, for um, research purposes. And so we also got their uh, appreciation scores for, for the beers that we analyzed, and then, and then we could make models for both. Next slide. And so actually some of the, the data that we gathered for first 250 Belgian beers, you can actually find in this book that's, that's available on Amazon. It's called Belgian Beer Tested and Tasted. And the cover luckily doesn't look like this, but it's not much more pretty than this. Uh, which is not something that we could decide. Um, so this, this book already summarizes a little bit of uh, the, the chemical analyses that we did and gives you a more scientific description of beers. But it's, it's not, of course, a, a list of 200 compounds for each beer that doesn't say anything. We really translate it into uh, more understandable language and, and really map the beers in such a way that you can easily see, oh, I like this beer and that beer and they're closed or they're, they're opposite. Um, so, but we had that data lying around um, and then we hired uh, Supinia here and now the team has expanded, but Supinia was really the pioneer. She just graduated with a degree in artificial intelligence from, from our university. And normally these people go into the computer business um, or they join Amazon, um, but we convinced her to, to come to our lab and study beers. <laughs> she didn't drink beer at the time. Now she's an avid beer drinker. So I guess we, we educated or ruined her depending on your us or her parents. Um, but long story short is that Supinia, after uh, a year or so uh, was able to develop models that with about an 83% accuracy could predict how well a certain beer would score on rate beer, not by tasting it, not by knowing which beer it is, but by just using the chemical analyses that we provided her. So that was quite cool. And what you see here are a few of those results. 
Um, of course, what you do for, for artificial intelligence is you, you need a huge training set on which you develop the models. And then you have a smaller test set of beers that you also analyze that are not involved in making the models and training the models, um, but that, that are then used to, to test how your model performs also on those beers that have never encountered the model or the model never encountered these beers. And those are the ones you see here. So what went into the model is way more than, than what you see here. All right, next slide. Um, but taking a step back, uh, the first thing we were really interested in was making, like I said, a, a scientific comparison of beers. And so that's, that's really the first thing we did. And this is actually a picture taken from, from this beer book where you see small numbers. I don't know if you can really see them. They don't really matter, but each number, there's 250 of them, is a specific Belgian beer. You also see uh, shaded the different styles, which of course overlap. Um, what, how the beers are mapped, so these 250 beers, these 250 dots on this plot here are only mapped according to their chemistry, 250 measurements of 250 aroma compounds. Um, but then spread in two dimensions through uh, some special of special form of principal component analysis that really pushes these 250 dimensions onto two dimensions. Uh, but we know the axis. So there's 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 not only just the spatial distribution of these strains. Um, the exact location means something. For example, I know by heart that if I go from from the left top to the bottom right. So in in, in this direction. Well, the camera. Uh, mirrors it. Um, I go from non-bitter to more bitter. Um, if I go uh, more to the uh, to the bottom, I get into hoppy flavors, and then you can see it there. More to the left bottom, you get more spicy aromas. So somehow this PCA plot automatically organized these beers in in a certain way that made sense. So um, if you start from a certain beer number fifty, I don't know where it is. Pick, pick a spot and you move, for example, more to the right bottom, starting from that beer. The next beer you will encounter is chemically very close to the beer you started from, but is a little bit more bitter or has a bit more hop aromas. Um, so you could easily travel this map and say, oh, I've tried, I don't know, Duvel. Uh, I really loved it, uh, but I would like to have something similar, maybe that has a bit more multi flavor. You could actually uh, travel this map and go from start from your duval and then move in the right direction and encounter a few beers on the way that we predict would fit that bill. It could also be a way to explore this vast uh, vastness of, of Belgian beers, and, and same would be true for US beers, of course, uh, where you say, oh, I don't know where to start. But by picking a few numbers that are far apart, you've really covered uh, much of the of the real spectrum. And you can, of course, see that that goes together a little bit with beer styles, but you also see that the beer styles overlap considerably uh, in some locations. And then you have the odd, odd beers out somewhere uh, that are mislabeled in terms of beer style or that at least are not your typical, uh, I don't know, fruit beers or, or, or triples or something. And then also cool uh, for brewers maybe is that you also see parts of the map that are underpopulated. <laughs> um, so even these 250 Belgian beers, which we carefully selected to try and cover the beer diversity we have, um, don't cover the full map. Now that, that means that that might be cool areas to explore. There might be new beers to be made that, that are exactly that combination of, of flavors. Could also be that people have tried this and that they were so horrible that they never made it to the market or weren't on the, on the market very long. That's something that we can predict with our next model, not, not from this thing yet. Um, next slide. So next step, um, when we had all this data and, and now we're really getting a bit more into the science um, is that you can start finding correlations between the different compounds. And here you just see some of the compounds that we measured, definitely not all of them. And we made a, a correlation graph. So what you see on, on this, um, on this uh, axis that goes from top left to bottom right is of course very red, uh, scale one, dark red, because there you're correlating a compound to itself. For example, acetaldehyde, which is all the way at the left and all the way at the top, 
uh, if you correlate in over 250 beers, the level of acid aldehyde with the level of acid aldehyde in the same beer, you get a perfect correlation because it's two times the same thing. More interestingly, if you go away from this uh, central axis, you start finding different compounds that correlate or anti-correlate. And, and some of them are maybe not a big surprise. For example, some of the acetate esters um, correlate with each other. We know that if you have a lot of isoamyl acetate, often you also have a bit more ethyl acetate and phenyl ethyl acetate. Uh, and that actually goes back to my PhD. Um, the reason is that, that these compounds are, are made by the same yeast enzyme. So you have two or three enzymes in yeast that make these uh, aroma active esters. And that often means that uh, if you make more of one, you also make more of the other. There are variations though, right? And, and you can tune it a little bit, but there are general correlations. It's not one-on-one, -on -one, but they're quite, quite good. And that's why they turn up red. And then oppositely, you find certain compounds that anti-correlate. Uh, one of the darkest blue colors, strongest anti-correlation is um, acidity and pH. <laughs> which is of course also quite, quite a trivial one uh, where you almost find the perfect anti-correlation. Uh, the more acidic, so the higher the acidity of a beer, the lower the pH will be. So you get an anti-correlation there, which is nothing new, but it's, good, it's a, it's a good uh, sanity check, I guess. But of course, we, we also found some more interesting unknown correlations that we're intrigued about and that we're trying to figure out and thinking about why are they there and also can we break them because in a way you're also looking at the limitations of beer brewing here right the things that co always correlate or anti-correlate with each other uh, those are the things as a scientist but maybe also as a brewer that you might want to tear apart to make a more unique beer so so those are some of the things we're, we're looking into now next slide please Next step again is not to correlate chemical compounds with chemical compounds, but chemical compounds with perceived aromas. So what you see on the horizontal axis now is um, ratings from our taste panel that are asked to rate a lot of, uh, of, of the specific beer flavors going from uh, you know, barnyard, uh, let's say Brettanomyces aroma, acetic uh, and lactic acid, 4-VG, uh, fruity esters, flowery esters, whatever, uh, all the things you see there. And again, it's not everything. And then some of these uh, chemical compounds. And, and then you can see, for example, that yes, uh, if you have more uh, acetate esters, like isoamyl acetate, you'll get more fruity aromas. Uh, those are the things we, we knew. You get some anti-correlations as well. Um, but then you also found some, or we also found some correlations that, that we didn't know about and that were interesting. And then lastly, you can start looking for correlations between compounds um, and uh, appreciation. And so these are all still, so that there's no confusion. These are sort of the simple things that you can still do without machine learning. So this is trying to look at uh, very specific compounds and see if some of them are strong enough, despite all these interactions uh, and complications that you have, if some of them are strong enough to learn something about the simple rules of, uh, of beer aroma that we can at least interpret. Next slide, please. So one of the, one of the um, examples I can give you is the uh, correlation or the influence between isoamyl acetate, so the fruity banana ester, and 4-VG, 4-Vinyl guayacol, the clove-like aroma that is so typical for Hefeweizen beers. And you get this, this <laughs> crazy uh, amount of data here that is plotted where you cannot see much, but next slide, please, Sean. Um, if you then model this, and now the models start coming into play, this is a bit what it looks like, and it, it doesn't look perfect because, of course, you know, although we have a lot of data, it's still not enough to get super smooth models, but it is enough to, to, for us to learn interesting things. Um, and for example, what I want to say on the left figure here, this is just perceived um, 4VG aroma. Uh, that's the color scale. So if you see yellow, the tasters tasted a lot of 4VG when they tasted the beer compared to the 4-vinyl guayacol concentration in the beer. So that's just a scientific measurement going up from bottom to top. And also 
the concentration of isoamyl acetate. And you do see a bit of an interaction. Uh, of course, if you have more 4VG in your beer, if you go from bottom to top, you see that the tasters start uh, noticing the 4VG aroma. And so the very top ones are the ones that are very bright yellow. But you also see if you go from left to right, even on the top, that if you go to the very right, you actually get quite dark uh, blue patterns, which means the tasters don't really notice too much 4VG, even though the concentration of 4VG is extremely high. So you have a bit of a masking effect. And even more interesting, and that's then on the, on the right of the two plots, um, is if you start looking at the overall appreciation, you notice that 4VG, having a lot of 4VG in your beer uh, is, is usually not a good thing, especially if you don't have a lot of isoamyl acetate. So you see if you go high on the graph and towards the left, it's very dark blue. So it's a low score for appreciation. But then if you go more to the right, uh, somehow uh, isoamyl acetate and 4VG seem to balance each other out. And some of the most highly appreciated beers are in that area. Of course, this is noisy, right? I, I'm not showing you the raw data. Trust me, it is noisy. It, it is much of it is personal preference. And, and those are some of the cool things that we can still look into. Um, so the last thing I want to say is that we can perfectly predict what is a good beer uh, and take all the creativity away. That's absolutely not the case. But overall, I think we, we are learning things that at least we didn't know. And I'm, I, I, I'm known for not liking 4VG. I actually, I'm very sensitive to it. Um, and I generally don't like it, not even in the beers where it's supposed to be in. Uh, but it is true that I rated some of these beers quite highly if there was enough um, isoamyl acetate. So that was a, a cool thing to, to see for us and, and a good example of the more simple things, yet new things that we can get from this data. Next slide, Sean. But then really where it, it goes uh, to the next level is when we start using the, the machine learning. The downside is that these models become so complex that you do not know exactly what's happening in the background. It really is a black box. So it's not like you can understand exactly what this model does. You don't know exactly um, you know, why a certain beer is, will, is predicted to be better appreciated or to have more of this or that aroma than another one. The, the model is a bit complex for that. But what you can do is you can take the chemistry of a beer and predict how it will be appreciated and how it, how it will taste. And you can also do these fun thought experiments without making a new beer or a new variant. You can just say, oh, if I, you know, if I take this beer with this chemical composition, but if I would have more uh, tiles from you know, fruity dry hopping, what would be the predicted appreciation? What would be the predicted aroma? Um, it's far from perfect, don't get me wrong, but it, 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 it allows you to at least you know, do some guesstimation of how it would look, um, which is a lot better than what we had before, which was a bit of you know, trial and error, maybe art, which is still a big part of it. But but at least it gives you a little bit of a, of a, a pointer, some guiding, some guidance, some ideas, maybe to, to try sort of things that are predicted to be good or interesting. Next slide. Um, and then this here, what you see on, on the right is very colorful graph that <laughs> looks like maybe it's made by NASA or so, or some, some image from Mars, I don't know. Um, actually, it looks better, I think, than the images from Mars. Um, this is really what the model looks like for, for our 250 beers mapped on this beer map that I showed before. Um, so you see uh, some of the beers lowly rated on the left there, but that's a very underpopulated area. So the model over interprets, over in interpolates a bit there. But you do see that the beers on the right bottom are, are extremely highly appreciated, but also on the left top. And so there's, again, there's things we can learn from this. We kind of know a little bit what's behind it. And at the very least, we can put a uh, sort of a beer on this map and then know a little bit in which direction we can go to maybe make it even more interesting or different from the rest. Next slide, please. All right, so that was my short introduction on the science. I, I must also admit that I'm only a geneticist and not a machine learning expert like Supinia. So <laughs> don't ask me any of the questions about machine learning. The, the only thing I can tell you is 
random forest trees. That's the best model for this. Um, but don't ask me what that is exactly. Uh, a few more slides before I hand it back to Jean for things that, that have nothing to do specifically with, with this aroma research, but that I figured might be interesting to some of you guys. Um, we started here at the university uh, in Belgium, in Leuven, uh, a new postgraduate course in malting and brewing science. It's a very high level academic course, so it's not a practical brewing course, um, but it's typically aimed at people that have a master's in science, some, some field of science, and that really want to go to the next level of uh, knowledge on beer specifically, so you get really deep scientific courses. Um, and it's really aimed at, uh, yeah, people that, that take up uh, leading positions as, as head quality, for example, uh, in, in specific breweries. It is uh, partly sponsored by uh, AB InBev. Of course, they also recruit people from this, but it's, it's definitely not exclusive. We have lots of guest speakers from small breweries uh, as well. Um, so that might be fun for you guys to know, except I think the international deadline for this year to apply and to get pre-selected uh, is already passed, but maybe in the next years. It, it is a full year course though, so it really involves coming to Belgium for a year and living here. Uh, tuition fees are uh, high for Belgium, 6,600 euro, but I guess low for the US. Next slide, please. Uh, a cheaper and easier option to dive a little bit into the science of beer is this free online course that we made now a year ago. Uh, so it's on the edX platform. Uh, edX, you see it there in this um, in the link in yellow uh, on the figure. So uh, if you go to the edX platform and you type science of beer uh, Verstreppen or something, my name, you will find our course. It's a 12 module course. Each module is about two hours or so. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty expand, expensive course that uh, is really aimed at brewers or beer enthusiasts that want to learn the basic science uh, behind beer. So it is quite scientific, right? It is a pretty heavy course and it's, it's all online. It was made with, with restricted uh, financial means. So we would like to have more animations and movies in there. But there's quite a few interviews with, with brewers um, from the US, also uh, Belgian brewers. There's some uh, movies inside, inside some of the cool breweries. Uh, we managed to get into Orval, which is not so easy. Uh, and interview Anne Francoise, the head brewer there. Uh, interview Hedwig uh, of Duvel. Interview uh, AB InBev people doing their things. Interview Charlie Bamford uh, over at UC Davis. Um, and, and in these 12 modules, we really take you to the science of beer. But it does require some feeling for, for science already. Otherwise, it will become a bit much. So you need to know, uh, let's say, what an enzyme or a protein is and, and what lipids are, that kind of stuff. Um, so in, in one year, already 12,000 people registered for it. So that, that was more than we ever expected. So it seems to be doing quite well. And you can, it's free. You can get a certificate for, I think, $100 or so. Uh, and that frees up a little bit more uh, content. Uh, and trust me, we are not seeing that money. It all goes to edX um, or, or the vast majority of it. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, that's just a movie for the course. You can see it online. And then uh, I already um, showed you the book that we produced uh, on Belgian beers that has a bit of a, a layman summary of some of the stuff I presented to you. It also has 50 pages of, of theory on beer aroma. And that's available from Amazon still. Um, I think there's only a few hundred copies left. And I just talked to the publisher. For some reason, they, it's, it's completely sold out in Dutch. It became a bestseller. Um, in the English, there are still a few copies left or a few hundred copies, but they're not, apparently, they don't want to do a second print. Don't ask me why. I must have pissed them off somewhere. Uh, so we're still looking into that. But if you still want to get your copy, now's the time. Okay, Jean, I think it's, uh, it's back to you then. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I think this was a, a super fascinating introduction to the science of things. And, and that brings me to uh, the last part of our talk, basically, where I want to talk a little bit about how we bring that that flavor intelligence, that um, that science of the flavor to the market. And so just as um, maybe a question for everyone here, like if you if you are willing to share in the chat, like um, what the data is that you use today to make decisions, right? I, I have a couple of examples here. 
um, of people using beer trends, right? And, and they either access or buy uh, beer trends reports. Uh, you obviously have a lot of IRI data about sales and point of sales data. Um, and then I, I also see a lot of Nielsen reports and, and other companies that come up with these um, insights that, that basically come from focus groups, interviews, surveys that they do. Um, and then the, the last element is something that's sometimes forgotten is that every brewer is always talking to their customer, right? And, and the value of that is not to be underestimated. Um, like I love the fact that most brewers here have, have tap rooms and brew pubs and, and make sure that they're well connected to their customer because I, I do think that's very important. But if you look at all these data points, there is a bunch of, um, you know, a bunch of detail and a bunch of uh, objectivity that's sometimes missing. And so we said like, well, what do we need to be able to give that more detailed view, that more actionable view? And so it starts with what Kevin just explained and these, um, these flavor maps that we can make based on a combination of sensory and chemical analysis. And, and we add to that a bunch of product data that we, that we find, right? So, um, you know, for us to complete the, the image, uh, we look at label data, we look at, uh, you know, the size of the packaging, uh, we do, we are starting to do some research in, in branding and marketing language and what we can find there um, to take that into account in our models. And a, a next step, like once you know the product really well, the next step is to start enriching that product data with consumer data. Um, I think we're uh, very particular and very, um, you know, in very uh, straightforward in, in what we want to gather from a consumer. Like for us, it's, um, uh, we are not looking for very detailed uh, sensory evaluations that a consumer does about a product because it is very individual, right? Every consumer has their own language. They have their own, um, they have their own words that they use and they're sensitive to different elements. So it's very hard from a consumer to get a complete picture. What we want to know is what stands out for that consumer. And so whether that's one element or it's a very detailed overview or, or textual analysis of what they smelled and tasted, that's up to the consumer because what a consumer shares and what they don't share, uh, it, it gives us insight in how they talk about products and why they like the product that they like. And that's the data that we are after. Um, even in the next step, we're, we're also interested in, in learning about the context in which people are, are consuming a beer, because as you know, having a beer in the summer on the beach or having that same beer in the winter in front of the fireplace can be a very, very different flavor experience. And so we want to take that into account as well. And a lot of that um, methodology that we use to gather data is a little bit inspired by, um, by something we, that is a, that's called the Proust effect or the Proust effect, depending on how you, uh, how you, uh, how you explain it. Um, and Proust was a French philosopher and he did a lot of research on uh, the emotional side of flavor experience. And, and so he is very well known for um, this Proust effect that is, um, you know, the emotion that you get when you uh, remember a flavor, when you remember something from your childhood. And in this case, um, he, uh, his grandmother used to make him these uh, Madeleine cakes. And so every time he smelled anything where you had that same particular Madeleine cake smell, it took him back to his childhood and triggered a big emotional response. And, and so for us as consumers, it's important to look for those elements. It's important to, to go look not only for what happens on your tongue and in your nose, but to also go look for what happens in your brain and, and what happens emotionally, because that's the, the data that really matters. That's going to explain us and, and uh, help us understand why a consumer likes what they like. And so that means that we have to gather, and I'm going a little bit faster over these, but it means that we're gathering all this data um, basically to, to provide value throughout the chain. But, but what I want to focus on um, in the last couple of slides is the value that this data can bring to brewers. And I think Kevin already touched on, on a couple of elements there, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of an overview. Um, so basically what happens is that, um, you know, analyzing your beer or having it analyzed by us 
um, both chemically and sensory and making sure that all the data is, is in there. It's a way to really create some, some super interesting and valuable analytics. And the first piece of value there is a very, very deep insight in the sensory and chemical profile of your beer, right? And, and that means um, in the first place, you get kind of a third party analysis of your beer that is as objective as possible, where you can look into the sensory elements, but you can really dig deep in every compound that is that is in your beer and, and that might have an influence on, on the overall appreciation or the overall quality of your beer. Um, interesting to note there is that it's not only the analysis of your beer, it's also, you know, what you see there on the bottom, it's a comparison to other beers in the markets. And, and as Kevin showed in those uh, flavor maps where you see all the beers in different dimensions, that's the kind of view that we also offer um, to people that, that send us their beer for analysis. And the third element there that I want to highlight is, is the off flavor analysis, right? I, I do um, think that that's a really important one. Um, and we very specifically go look for, uh, you know, off flavors that might have an impact on the quality of your beer. And not only do we detect them, but we, we also, you know, as far as we can give you some pointers as on how to get rid of them, how to, you know, different strategies that you could apply uh, to try to get rid of them in, in the case it's an off flavor, of course. I know that for some, uh, some beers and some styles that an off flavor that is an off flavor for one style is maybe not an off flavor for another. So we try to take that into account as well. So, so first of all, getting that insight in your beer and in your, in your portfolio, like that's a, that's a first added value. A second big uh, domain where this kind of data can really help you, and, and again, Kevin touched on it, is um, to, look for, to look for the market and to look at the market and analyze and observe what is happening in the market. Um, only, not only you know, looking and analyzing where your beers are and how your portfolio stacks up to the competition, uh, but also look at like, the balance within your portfolio and maybe the white spaces that you can find in the market where you see like, hey, there in, in that area, in my region, for example, there's not really a beer in that space. So it might be interesting for our brewers to start experimenting in that style or in that flavor direction. Um, so that's a, a, a really, really interesting um, tool where, you know, over time, what we hope is that brewers will will send us their beer to make these kind of decisions and, and help make, a, make that kind of decision. And then a third element that I also really want to emphasize because it ties up to the, uh, to the story that I started with when I was talking about challenges is that there, there is a big help that this data can bring when you talk about marketing and sales. And uh, this is a reason also why we not only look at the, the actual flavor data and the chemistry and the sensory elements, but we also want to look at branding. We also want to look at the colors on the label and the packaging choices that you make, because that also allows us to give you, um, to give you feedback on Look, uh, for example, your beer flavor wise is very similar to these, but you give it a different style name and that can be a deliberate, a deliberate choice or that can be that, you know, it's something that you want to change because it's, it's very um, surprising for a consumer that they expect something different from your product than they actually get, right? Um, but even, you know, creating a mood board of packagings of all the beers that flavor wise are comparable to you, like that's something that we, uh, that we can easily do and that might help you in your, you know, labeling design, et cetera. So that, that marketing element is very important. And even more, um, it's a way to communicate your brand, like making sure that a bartender knows how to talk about your product, that they have all the information that they need to talk about your product. Um, and, then, and then thirdly, or lastly here, um, make sure that you have all the data that, that puts you in a negotiation position with retailers, right? So if you can go to a retailer, and, and this is what we already do for retailers, we look at their assortments and we do the same thing. We look for white spaces in their assortments and say like, well, look, your customers uh, might, wanna, might want this style and, and your offering is not really there. And then they can start looking for beers in that style, in that white space. 
and obviously all the beers that are in our database, they they have a better chance of popping up there. And that's a, that's a service that we really want to uh, want to create. Um, and that's that's really interesting there. And I want to jump here and then come back to the pitfalls because uh, the last thing that we're also offering and building is that once you have all this data, you can make amazing recommendations, right? So once you get data about all the products and you have a little bit of data about what consumers are, are sensitive to, you can start creating personalized recommendations and, and recommendations that are not based on, you know, a thousand people like product A and B, you like product A, so I'm gonna recommend you product B. That's the easy way of doing it. What we're going to do is um, try to gather data from you, from Amanda and, and Theo in this side about what you like, what you prefer, um, try, to, try to hear from you what you're sensitive to. And then we're going to look in the database for products that will appeal to you, right? And, and that's kind of the, uh, the layer that we put on, to, on top of that for retailers, but also for brewers that are having their own e-commerce. There's, there's definitely some, some uh, value that we can bring there. Um, and then basically the end, um, and, and so, you know, we're Belgian, so we're putting everything in perspective, uh, every time, um, I, I want to show, or I want to talk a little bit about a couple of, uh, remarks or questions that I get quite often. And, and whenever we talk about AI and artificial intelligence and deep learning, uh, the first question we get is, well, you know, isn't AI going to lead to all of the same, right? Aren't we going to end up with that one perfect average beer um, and we're going to stifle innovation and creativity? And my answer is always like, well, the good thing about AI is that you, you still, humans still control it, right? So you can still push the model to go towards divergence and um, you can push the model to really help people find something that they wouldn't uh, try otherwise. And, and the, the reference that I usually make is the difference between, you know, what you often see on Amazon is when you buy one product, you get more of the same. But if you look on Spotify, they are making these recommendations where you get a totally different style of music because they found some similarities in the music patterns, in the audio, uh, in the instruments that are being used. And so you can, you can you know, steer the model in a certain direction, which is what we're absolutely doing. And then the second pitfall or the second challenge for us is that good insights require good data. And so it's all about garbage in, garbage out and quality in, quality out. Um, so what we are very, very focused on is in getting the best data that we can and getting the most complete picture of both products and consumers to make sure that we can offer the best recommendations and the best insights for you. Um, and so that's kind of our goal and our mission is to make that flavor data and that flavor intelligence available for, for every brewer out there. Um, that's kind of uh, where I wanted to end this. Um, and maybe I saw in, uh, in the chat that there have been a couple of people um, asking a questions uh, asking questions. So um, if there are any, maybe Jen, you can help us out here and uh, let us know if there are questions. Yeah, I, I think Ethan, I saw was the only one, but I think Kevin answered his question. Correct, Ethan? Pretty sure. Um, was, I, I, just, I didn't Go know. ahead. Sorry. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm... <laughs> Different algorithms, random forest models. Okay, right. I'm just backing up into the chat. Sorry. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, I guess that kind of answers it. I just wanted to say on top of that, um, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that's often true about uh, craft beer and brewing is that people come to it from previous lives. There's a lot of people in this field that, you know, did something else first for a little while and then, you know, for whatever reason, ended up in craft beer. And I think that that's actually pretty cool. It leads to some of the diversity and approaches that we get. Um, for myself, uh, I, I got a PhD in cognitive psychology, um, <laughs> focusing on speech perception. But, um, you know, along the way, of course, I learned a lot about sensation and perception and, and you know, memory and learning and all this kind of stuff. So all the stuff that you're talking about super resonates with me. 
um, you know, tying the data in and whatever else. And that's why I asked, you know, about neural networks and learning and whatever else. So thank you. That was very interesting. Um, there's one less copy of your book on Amazon already. <laughs> Appreciate it. Snag it, <laughs> I would say. Great. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Um, and so just before we, we close out, I, if um, any brewery is interested, uh, Jean, in getting, getting in touch with you both and, and using your data, how would they go about doing that? Yeah, definitely. So the easiest way at this point is to either um, go to our website and on the website, you can schedule a demo or, or schedule a meeting with me directly at this point. Um, uh, and then the, the other way to reach us is right here on this slide is um, just send an email to contact at esther.ai and, and within you know, a matter of hours, we'll, uh, we'll get you a response and, and see how we can help you. Uh, we're really, really interested in feedback from the whole community at this point. And so if there is any questions, any follow-up that you would like to do, please um, get in touch. That's, uh, that's what we're looking for. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Kevin. This was fabulous. Uh, learned a lot and it looks like everyone else did too. So thank you both very much. Have a wonderful day and we hope to see you next uh, for the next session at 1130 Emerging Styles. Everyone have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.